up only. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all Up only. Hello and welcome to Up Only. I'm Ledger, had Kobe on the show, and the uh, co-founder of Ethereum, founder of Consensus, Joe Lubin's with us today. We'll get to that in just a moment. Thanks for being here to all of you. First, let me tell you about our partners at FTX. Go to uponly.tv slash FTX. You can make any trade there today directly from one asset to the other. Do it all on FTX. You can also earn yield on your tokens. Go to uponly.tv slash FTX. Earn 5% beyond $10,000. Track your portfolio is known and loved since 2014. Thanks to them for being our partners. Uponly.tv slash FTX. Let's get to the show. Kobe, Joe, how you doing? <laughs> no one saw you mess up, mate. It was fine. It was totally good. Nobody saw it. Nobody, <laughs> Nobody saw realized it. that you totally messed up, completely put the wrong screens on. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, fine. fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, Joe, how you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Welcome, welcome. So you um, co-founded Ethereum, co-founded Consensus, co-founded ETH Suisse. Anything else you co-founded? You co-founded everything? <laughs> uh, I've uh, not co-founded uh, everything. Uh, a very small number of things in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Just a very, very large things. things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining us. This is the first time we've ever started the show uh, early. Ledger texted me and was like, Joe's here. And I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> it's like sprint upstairs. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I ran today. Um, feeling healthy um but yeah thank you for joining us uh, i'm looking forward to to uh to chatting like mostly ethereum stuff but hopefully a bunch of other stuff um as as well um and like can you just give us the short version of like how you started co-founding all these things like when did this begin where did it like where did where did the inspiration come from what's the story of how this all started yeah so when i was a kid i I was like, I really need to co-found lots and lots of things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I, I've just been a, a technologist uh, for, for most of my life. And uh, I, I did uh, about 10 years of work post-college uh, in robotics, machine vision, AI, or, or neural nets, lots of software engineering over the years. Um, and it was really a question of, of right place, right time. I... Uh, I moved into the financial space um, and grew pretty disappointed, uh, bordering on depressed with the state of the economy, the state of financial systems, the state of geopolitics. Um, and I sort of didn't, I, I was reasonably successful uh, in that space for a little while and then uh, things started to get weird in uh, 2005, 2007, 2008. Um, uh, trades turned into risk on, risk off trades. Uh, fundamentals were irrelevant. Um, and uh, so I, like many people in that time, uh, began to get educated on how monetary systems uh, were built and operated and uh, et cetera. So, so deep down the rabbit hole. Um, and uh, so when I read uh, Satoshi's paper uh, in early 2011, um, I uh, basically felt that uh, there's, there's no point in, in being concerned or depressed about how things were going on the planet. Um, we could recognize that uh, centralized top-down command and control systems had done amazing things for millennia uh, for human civilization, uh, but that... Uh, they were bankrupt um, in a technological sense, in a moral sense, um, and certainly in a financial sense, uh, where, where there's just way too much debt in the system because politicians were able to be influenced and, and uh, um, essentially break systems that, that could potentially work. Uh, but uh, uh, now we need systems that can't be broken. It'll, it'll take a lot of time 
uh, to build those systems to make them sturdy and, and harden them and, and make them well thought out. But um, 2011, I read the white paper and I realized, hey, we can re-architect um, the whole thing on a new, more sound trust foundation. So Satoshi invented um, digital scarcity. Uh, he invented, they invented a, uh, a new trust foundation for the planet. Um, and a bunch of different projects um, were realizing in 2012, 2013, that, hey, we should apply this uh, not just to the, the narrow use cases around money, but, but to everything that we care about, everything that would benefit from increased trust, um, either in transactions or in relationships. And, and so um, Vitalik's, I, I, uh, I met Vitalik January 1st, 2014 at a meetup in Toronto, um, spoke to him for a little while uh, and read the white paper um, that night uh, that he wrote describing the Ethereum system. Um, and it, it just became clear to me and to many others uh, who were Bitcoiners. Um, you know, the, I, I was an expert Bitcoiner at that point, but wasn't doing anything business-wise in the space. Um, it just became clear that uh, this was a way to build a system uh, better, faster, more expressive uh, than what would be possible uh, on the Bitcoin technology at any point in the near future. So Bitcoin had a, a fourth based scripting language. Uh, that was the, the quote virtual machine. Um, and uh, Ethereum would enable any software developer uh, to get in there and certainly the of scalability and usability and other sorts of uh, things that uh, we need to continue to improve. But it's really all about uh, having a vision and having the expressive programmatic power to execute that. And uh, that's all gone um, quite well so far. Yeah. So you just said to Vitalik, let's do it. You gave him the nod. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. I'm, I want in. <laughs> Um, so the way it happened was uh, um, I uh, had spoken to Anthony DiOrio. Uh, I'm from Toronto. Anthony's from Toronto. Alex's from Toronto. Um, and I respected one of the things that he did. He, uh, there was this Bitcoin foundation that was sort of co-opting or trying to co-opt the, the Bitcoin space um, in, in weird ways. And, and that experiment didn't go that well. Uh, but uh, Anthony was trying to create... Uh, I think it's the Global Bitcoin Alliance, and, and he was saying, "Hey, we should we should take a, a bottom up approach to to building alliances and stuff like that." So I respected what I read about that and reached out to him, um, and he invited me to this meetup. Um, and then a bunch of us were just uh, staying close to the project on Skype, um, and a few weeks later, um, Anthony took a house in Miami uh, and 11 of us uh, were um, invited sleeping at the house and another like 20 or 30 were rolling through on a daily basis. It, it was uh, there was a lot of energy around the Ethereum project uh, at that point, even before it was announced. But uh, we were all there to try to figure out an organization for the project. And Vitalik was invited to the North American Bitcoin conference in, uh, in Miami. Uh, to deliver his paper, really. And it was uh, um, a really big room, uh, packed five people deep uh, at the back. Uh, so there was already a, a lot of buzz around uh, around what he'd written up. And back, back then, did you have the vision of what Ethereum would be today? Like, was it clear to you that you'd have these sort of DeFi um, applications as they've evolved and you'd have the sort of NFT world? Or was it just kind of like anything's possible, but we're not totally sure what anything looks like yet? Uh, so qualified, yes, obviously not not the details, um, but uh, we knew the the power of decentralized protocols. We knew the power of, of creating a new trust foundation for the planet um, and re-architecting systems based on that new trust foundation. We actually, so we did a little um, conference thing in Toronto in April of 2014. So like really three months later, 
um, and we printed up a bunch of Ethereum t-shirts and on the back there were um, tiny scripts, um, little programs, uh, and one of them was a Dropbox program in like four or five lines. Another was uh, a Twitter program, I think maybe, and uh, another was uh, basically issuing a, a token. Um, so early on, it was certainly about DeFi. Uh, we anticipated that, uh, that a rich financial infrastructure would be built, uh, and Vitalik, um one of his motivations was that uh, he wanted to to make it easy for projects to set up their own, set up and launch their own tokens. Um, at that point, um, and maybe earlier than that, you really had to uh, fork the Bitcoin code base and and make your modifications and um, entice a whole lot of people to to secure your network with you, to participate, to uh, lend their resources, et cetera. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if you could just write a, a four line program and, and benefit from the security of, a, of an existing network. So basically, yes, we, we did anticipate, some of us anticipated re-architecting society on, on decentralized protocols. Yeah, that's interesting. So as it sort of played out, what are the things that you think you've been most surprised by? Like the, the things that were like totally like, oh, I didn't I didn't expect dog coins. <laughs> I didn't expect the dog money. Um yeah, I there a huge number of things that were mildly and amusingly surprising. Um but uh the mission was pretty big to start with. Um and um it was obvious that it would have to grow organically in a decentralized fashion. Um, early on, I knew that uh, in order to uh, affect uh, a massive transformation, that uh, that the early people would have to um, just have so many conversations with so many people. Uh, and so I, I knew it would be uh, a many year endeavor. Um, I knew that uh, we'd have challenges early on uh, in terms of financial sustainability. Um, it was one of the reasons why uh, Consensus um, was interested in working with uh, with early adopter corporations um, to try to help them understand the technology and also to, to keep the company going. Um, but uh, I, I don't know that anything has just been um, uh, a shocking surprise. Uh, you know, human nature is uh, is what it is, uh, and uh, it, we're blessed with infinite creativity on the positive side and on the negative side. How much education did you have to do um, talking to corporate? entities that wanted to build on blockchain and you had to encourage them to or educate them on the benefits of developing on an open blockchain a decentralized blockchain versus like a corporate chain or something that they have more direct control over yeah so in the early days it was it wasn't us cold calling companies and say hey you got to build some software on a blockchain uh de decentralize uh your stuff um it was um early adopter passionate people inside of banks and insurance companies and, and other kinds of entities um projects and in, in, companies in, in supply chains um that got religion themselves uh and that they were the bitcoin person inside the company uh, basically and you know they looked like idiots uh for a year or two uh and then everybody was going to them um asking them for advice and and they ended up running the uh the blockchain group or the innovation group or, or, or something like that so um we had lots of those conversations uh, um, executives were pulled in we did just an enormous amount of um education and fostering of adoption either in structured courses or, or just conversations with people um we did lots of pocs to help projects uh, companies understand um the technology uh we did not try to push companies to mainnet early on uh mainnet uh, for quite a long time was a a rough hewn immature technology um we were trying to build products um uh, mainnet 
the technology itself was immature, the products were immature. Um, so we ended up doing a bunch of gigs that uh, helped us understand what, what companies needed um, and, and helped us essentially build products. Um, so we did entertain very early on what we call the convergence thesis was that uh, we and other revolutionaries in our ecosystem would build out uh, the technology uh, in the, the Byzantine context, the, the most difficult context, and then we would um, offer the exact same technology or nearly the exact same technology with some enterprise enhancements um, to early adopter corporations so that they can wrap their heads around the technology and uh, and eventually we would uh, converge um, and we will all converge effectively on mainnet but it's not going to be uh, on layer one mainnet it's going to be on a modularized decentralized protocol ecosystem where you have um, subnets or, or private chains that have bridged other private chains that have bridged uh, to different mainnets and so we're, we are seeing the shape of uh, of the IT architecture of Web3 um, being built out right now. Um, I strongly encourage anyone who, who wants to to read about that vision. Um, Polynius, um, P-O-L-Y-N-Y-U-S dot medium dot com does a, a really good job of laying that out. Uh, that person is also a liberosist, um, Reddit, L-I-B-E-R-O-S-I-S-T. I'm just going to rely on our moderator to help us with this. <laughs> They're going in the show notes if the moderator got that. <laughs> uh, hopefully they did. Um, if you could go back now to sort of the beginning of um, this whole thing, what, do you, what are some of the things that you think you would change or try and do differently or you, you know, say, uh, like, in hindsight, I would have really liked to have um, made more progress in this area or done, done this a bit, um, a bit different in the past? So I'm not the kind of person uh, that would go back and and believe that if I had done one thing differently, um, it would have been better or if anyone had done things differently. Um, the way that progress is made is by trying things, uh, failing or not quite hitting the mark and, and improving. Um, and so uh, I think it's just astonishing how quickly and how well uh, this has all come together. It was a... Uh, a very ragtag group of, of people, um, so, so, some of which are, were you know, functional um, in mainstream society, some of, some of which were railing <laughs> against ma mainstream society. Um, and the power of the ideas uh, essentially held us together. We, there, there's it's no secret that we, we may have had a discussion or two uh, with differing opinions uh, inside uh, the, the core team um, at Ethereum in, in the first year. Uh, but the project was so powerful. The vision was so powerful. And Vitalik did a, a great job uh, as a very young individual of, uh, of setting an intellectually honest tone, a tone of integrity uh, and that that took us through to to basically the launch of, of version one of the network and uh, you know beyond that uh, the ecosystem has has bloomed organically as, as it had to yeah a, a bunch of that ecosystem blooming i guess um like ethereum started to click for a lot of people when they got uh like web uh, browser wallets so you could sort of jump to a site and just sort of log in with ethereum right you have your address in your browser um you can just instantly connect to a, a new app and consensus um created owns metamask created metamask don't know what the correct terminology here is um but that, like that's yeah, by so, far the... so aaron aaron davis uh founded that project uh quickly brought on uh so in and uh aaron joined consensus very early um mm -hmm. So effectively brought, uh, I don't even remember what stage it was It was in, um, <laughs> the, the MetaMask technology, uh, but it was super early uh, and and we built a team around him. But that is the, the glorious origin. Uh, there was a little bit more <laughs> around that. Uh, uh, there, there's uh, uh, an individual named Joel Dietz um, who um, tells people 
uh, that he was a founder of that project and uh, um, it, it might be a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? I'm, I'm changing my bio right now to co-founder of MetaMask. Yeah. I'm doing it. Awesome. So, so that's a great <laughs> idea. Like a, yeah. an, I, I am Spartacus moment. Uh, I, am co, I am MetaMask co-founder. I hear, that, I hear that with Ethereum too. Like I know there are a handful of Ethereum co-founders, but I swear oh, I, I, there's 20 I, I or 30 think, of them running so, around. So I, yeah, I hate to bust too much on Joel Dietz because uh, he's a he's a smart individual um, and he has a, a different take on some historical facts. But I think he has <laughs> possibly said said something about uh, um, being co-founder ish or co-founder like for Ethereum as well. Interesting. Yeah, I'm in Ethereum co-founder too. I'm doing it. Yeah, Can you just say yes, you are, and I've got proof. Like, I was there, wasn't I? I was. I was in that house, eleven person house. I was person number six. Yeah, so so pro <laughs> projects add co-founders for like months and years, really. Uh, so maybe maybe we should have levels of co-founder. <laughs> and for projects like Ethereum and MetaMask, I think it's reasonable that we should all consider ourselves. Uh, uh, originators and owners at some point in the history of the projects. Um, MetaMask has a, has a decentralized future ahead of it. Um, we're trying to figure that out right now. We're, uh, we will enlist the help of the community in figuring that out. So, so there will, is that, is there will that token be a MetaMask Ledger? core. Um, Ledger, was that token confirmed? Yeah, sure. Chat, chat is saying, I might have token confirmed. <laughs> you know, every time something like this happens, though, those spammers start creating like fake MetaMask and <laughs> sending them to everyone's wallets. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can, I can confirm that that MetaMask will recognize and support tokens in the future. <laughs> we just broke news. Hey, if you yeah, want this is the first time this has ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to uh, co-found up only, we are uh, you know still welcome to <laughs> adopting new co-founders for up only. If you need to so, add media magnate to your list of titles. Uh, I I was going to ask you about that actually. Uh, yeah, there, there's a group that I'm aware of uh, that that wants to use the name up only. Have you trademarked? That um, name? We haven't, but CMS intern, our lovely intern, they pitched the, him as well, and he was like, "Look, y'all can use this name, but we will troll you endlessly for using it." So, yeah, someone social... else tried to oh, use that, it. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, so. that's yeah. absolutely perfect. So, so there's a group, there's a group of people that I'm aware of that's, uh, uh, it's trying to create a decentralized airline called Up Only Air Flyers Club. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a it's a weird it's a weird mix of they, of they can use it that's better we'll change our name and, and nft artists <laughs> yeah well, look if they're making like, if they're making decentralized planes that sounds a little bit 2017 yeah. to me but yeah. like that's a good name for decentralized yeah. planes so we'll just change our name to something else <laughs> we'll change it I'll, to metamask I'll link you with that group. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the metamask podcast yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, that's that's fine. So, um, and and MetaMask. So we're, we're saying token may be confirmed. We're we're, we're not sure. That, it sounded like token confirmed to me, but it's got like what twenty. It, it, it was not token confirmed, but uh, the, oops. Uh, there 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 will be an exciting future of NFT tokens and fungible tokens uh, that MetaMask will recognize and support, including all the ones that uh, it currently recognizes and supports, and we will look to. Uh, build mechanism uh, via mechanism design uh, into the project uh, so that uh, uh, the community can have some sort of signaling power. Um, and, and, you know, there may be a future where some core elements um, are made easily available, even more easily available. Um, there, uh, you may be aware that uh, uh, a plugin architecture um, is going to go live in the not too distant future. So uh, MetaMask is already an ecosystem and it's gonna be more explicitly an ecosystem. I'd like to back up a little bit to when you're talking about the way you envisioned uh, Ethereum scaling, because you talked about kind of this modularization of Ethereum and um, potentially even hinting at 
stuff yeah. n- not happening on mainnet but also not happening on layer one was the were the technical constrictions around the scalability of layer one were those intentional or just uh, what were what were the thought processes around like how how you would go from being you know putting a, a small number of applications on ethereum layer one to supporting a large number of applications but maintaining the security model that you get from ethereum layer one yeah so you you don't build netflix that supports um tens of thousands of streaming movies to millions of homes um in 1992 um you you build a a dvd delivery service and and you get busy trying to to build out uh, uh, incremental uh, capabilities Uh, so we did uh, something that was unprecedented uh, and we did it at the scale that made sense in order to protect the thing that uh, was most sacred uh, which is decentralization and security Uh, and um, so in I remember sitting in a room in Miami uh, in in that house um, talking about uh, how we needed to shard the system. Um, And we still thought we'd be able to do proof of stake um, at that moment. And we we eventually fell back. There are a lot of uh, difficult edge cases around the existing proof of stake system. And we fell back to, hey, we know we can nail uh, a really good proof of work system. Let's do that. and we'll figure out proof of stake uh, seven years later, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a year, a year later, or two years later. Uh, and if if you watch, uh, so Vitalik did a tweet storm maybe a year or so ago uh, about uh, his meandering odyssey um, with a, a whole bunch of smart people uh, trying to figure out uh, how, to, how to build a rock solid, uh, massively decentralized uh, proof of stake consensus system. Um, it, pretty remarkable and it looks meandering but uh again um you do something uh you learn about it um and you do something a little better and maybe you have to turn around go in a different direction but uh uh, he moved in a bunch of interesting straight lines not one perfect straight line but uh um, the result is is pretty remarkable um and so we built something as scalable as could be built and we understood that it would be sufficient for figuring out certain things like what is a decentralized application uh, what is a smart contract how do you build user interfaces on that uh, how do you um, build developer tools uh, a an ecosystem around that um, what sorts of wasn't called DeFi back then, but uh, what, what sorts of financial applications make sense? Uh, we started building an accounting system early on uh, at Consensus, um, and we were too early. Uh, there are a bunch of things that, that we built that we were too early on that are um, doing great right now. Uh, and so um, the ecosystem went through different phases of, of reaching up to low-hanging fruit and executing those things. So. Um, building the decentralized protocols, um, uh, building efficient systems so that the people and companies that contribute resources to, to run things um, can do so and, and be compensated for that. Uh, trading tokens uh, supported the very early speculative, heavily speculative phases of the emergence of a, of a new economy, really. Um, and uh, we're able to reach higher and higher to increasingly higher hanging fruit. And uh, um, and so more and more functionality uh, is being made uh, material for, for more and more people's lives. Um, so one of the earliest popular use cases was uh, remittances. Um, and that certainly impacted lots of people. Cryptocurrency is a great use case. Um, but it, it's just astonishing to see how literally millions of people are now affected uh, by the NFT phenomenon. And these are people who are just using technology and not in many cases understanding um, the underlying mechanism uh, of the technology. And so that, that's a major breakthrough, major crossing of the chasm uh, for, for our, our ecosystem. 
Yeah, it's, in, the NFT thing is super interesting because I've been doing crypto, what, nine years now or something? Nine years. And um, I have a bunch of friends that I've over and over and over tried to get into crypto. And sometimes they're interested at the top of a bull run, like like December 2013, they were very interested. And then December 2017, again, they were very interested. Um, but they never really did anything or... Um, uh got involved when i was trying to sort of shield them on it but then when nfts came around they were like super early to art blocks they were like really 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 engaged with a a, a lot of the stuff that was happening um and particularly like supporting smaller artists on foundation and platforms like that uh, or like super rare um platforms like that where they were just like they were obsessed with it and they like spending more time on crypto than me and i'm like okay this is this has clearly converted a lot more people than um like the tokens of the past or the financial applications or uh, or whatever um but at the same time you have a group of people who have had the almost opposite reaction this sort of hostile um uh hatred <laughs> of uh of nfts um initially because of the uh i guess climate um narrative that was uh surrounding it but as um as things move forward now, I think they just like really just hate NFTs and they don't know why. The internet told them to hate it. Yeah, yeah, they found like a, a community of people. Um, do you think that goes away over time, or why do you think there's been such like sort of a visceral reaction to this technology? <laughs> um, I think it's human nature. Um, I recall vaguely um, similar reactions to the internet, the web. Um, uh, so it's it's about uh, uh, people with uh, entrenched or, or vested interests, um, either squawking themselves or creating memes and, and disseminating those memes into different channels to, to try to slow things down. Um, I think I think vested interests are smart, and they probably uh, so so there's knee jerk reactions, um, but uh, people are are trying to protect their own agendas um and it's probably not about stopping things it's probably about slowing things down so that you can position yourself so the banking industry for instance might just be interested in slowing things down uh, i know that uh, many in the banking industry are, are fomo fomoing at the mouth uh to try to uh, about getting into uh DeFi. um and um, politicians, for instance, uh, they you know they just will say anything uh, in order to uh, uh, to try to get support from from certain constituencies. Uh, so I, I don't worry too much about naysayers. Um, we do our best to to be patient and educate and, and point out uh, the ten x, hundred x, thousand x benefits that uh, that will accrue when when these things um, are made more usable and more scalable. Um, can't, can't really worry too much. The, the climate, uh, so, so it's certainly an issue that uh, the proof of work um, does a lot of wasteful computation and creates a lot of waste heat and burns a lot of electricity. Um, Ethereum, Ethereum has a solution for that. Uh, Layer 2 has a solution for that. And, uh, and the merge uh, where Ethereum 2 um, essentially surgically excises proof of work uh, from from the execution chain uh, and replaces it with uh, a more decentralized, uh, more scalable and, and uh, much less expensive and less, much less uh, uh, energetically um, expensive um, consensus mechanism. Uh, so Ethereum's in great shape. Um, Bitcoin, I think, will figure this out. Um, certainly, burning energy is a bit of a religion uh, as a uh, f for some of uh, the Bitcoiners, um, equating uh, the soundness of money uh, to uh, the to energy. Essentially, um, is a good hypothesis, um, but I think that. Um, uh, when we land the transition to proof of stake, it's, it's going to be a, uh, uh, a pretty powerful data point um, that will call that into question. Um, and I kind of think that, uh, that 
the Bitcoin ecosystem navigates that. I, I think that they basically uh, point to um, sustainable mechanisms um, for mining. Um, maybe gets a little more energy efficient, uh, but uh, as long as it's renewable energy, um, uh, they may be able to stay the course. I'm pretty intrigued. Yeah, I saw some okay. after you, Ledger. Take it away. I'm pretty intrigued by uh the bitcoin narrative for essentially providing grid support and consistency using green energy to do so and uh especially as like rolling blackouts and all these things for the way the mm -hmm. energy system works are all you know societal dangers and if bitcoin can really play a role there that would be a fascinating way, way to continue in a proof of work manner so um, that, that one's a bit of a, a bit of a stretch to me. It's I, like, well, uh, it sounds, yeah, when, yeah. When there is excess energy, we'll just sop it up for you. And yeah. Um, However, that what I was getting towards there is like it sounds like a really uphill battle to actually convince people yeah. that by using a bunch of energy for you know confirming transactions that you're doing more good than bad. And it seems like Bitcoin has the significantly larger PR battle ahead without that kind of secondary solution, like you mentioned that ETH has. And I've, I've always been baffled, like why the NFT haters are yeah. blaming energy when it's like, look at, look yeah. at where so it's it, moving. It's become, there, there's a lot of organization behind that meme, uh, the uh, energy and efficiency uh, greenhouse gas meme. Um, if uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem organized itself and calculated uh, the various different kinds of waste in the traditional financial system, both energetic and and just in terms of societal coordination. I mean, it's orders of magnitude more efficient uh, to, to build a system just on Bitcoin, uh, let alone Ethereum. Another thing about the network effects with Ethereum that Kobe was hinting at is just how many people NFTs clicked with. Um, are, were you surprised how many people were pulled on chain finally? Like even people who were somewhat in crypto, but they don't, their only thing they knew about crypto was a centralized exchange. And then an NFT comes along and it's like, I'm sure MetaMask numbers exploded, you know, in terms of number of people using MetaMask, number of people doing activities directly on chain. Um, was it surprising to you to see that uh, inherent adoption of non-financial products on a blockchain? And also what other type of non-financial products do you think we'll, we'll see that type of adoption for? Um, so it's gratifying and validating, um, not that surprising. Um, just it, it's really, um, I guess, joyful to, to see um, little mainstream impact um, for, for the stuff that we've been intimate with for a long time. Um, we've been doing NFTs for a pretty long time. Um, we had a project called Ujo Music uh, that uh, uh, essentially created a platform um, and they did, uh, they did issue um, NFTs like uh, um, artwork um, around, uh, around songs. Uh, we have a, a team called Trium uh, that does uh, the Euler Beats series of NFTs. Um, Futures, the, the most recent one, and it's, it is astonishing. Check out EulerBeats.com slash Futura. Um, they have been doing NFTs um, for maybe three years. Um, so a bunch of it was provenance uh, in, in different supply chains. So uh, we've done work with LVMH and Procter & Gamble and others. Um, they uh, issued uh, something like NFTs tracking tuna uh, in a supply chain from bait to plate. Uh, so I uh, was, wasn't trying to, to do any uh, uh, any advertising there, but uh, tuna uh, on a blockchain is exactly the, what I was anticipating. It's the future. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, it came it came to us in one of our ethereal events as a uh, as sushi. So it was. Uh, it was uh, a really great use case uh, for blockchain. Um, so we haven't been surprised. Um, we, we've been early on a bunch of stuff, and uh, and we've been patient. We've been able to be patient and stay the course on a lot of things, and uh, and it's all happening. And it's looking like you know, my my new favorite phrase: "We're all going to make it." <laughs> 
Um, you said uh, that uh, banks and institutions were um, starting to feel a little bit of FOMO for DeFi. Um, yeah. What what has sort of been what has stopped them getting in? Do they have like KYC um, issues, like uh, uh, issues like keeping their own keys safe and stuff, or is it just a whole new world? Uh, regulation. Uh, if you're a, a bank holding company in the U.S., uh, I don't think they like it when you have crypto assets on your balance sheet. Um, so it's uh, it's just complicated for them. They 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 are powerful financial institutions, um, but they live their lives in straitjackets, you know, pretty much with uh, with regulators monitoring a lot of stuff. Um, and we're facing a world or, or we're, we're building a world where um, many sorts of organizations, including consensus, are starting to build non-bank banks uh, for consumers that they can carry around in their pockets. And in non-bank um, fintech infrastructure uh, for institutions who uh, will be able to construct their own financial instruments and wire up their own financial flows without the benefit of of the intermediaries that uh, tend to lock you in and, and take uh, a big chunk. Uh, so that's that's obviously the theme, the major theme of our, our a major theme of our ecosystem. It, it's trust and it's disintermediation. Um, and the banks will will navigate this. They navigate lots of uh, technological evolutions, um, and they will. Some banks are, are creating these little cafe lounges uh, for their people. There's a Capital One uh, down the street, and, and they have they have couches. And uh, I think they they think people are going to bring their laptops and, and have a coffee there. Um, the point is that um, banks are generally filled with pretty smart people, a lot of uh, human and monetary capital, um, and they will adjust they'll continue to to service the older cohorts uh, for as long as it's financially um viable to do so um but increasingly they'll, they'll stand up or invest in other kinds of organizations that uh, that do things in a different way um and um it will be a way that uh, uh enables from the way we think about it, a consensus is uh, enables the wild west. Enables uh, um, thanks for the term, Gary, uh, Gary Gensler, uh, but but enables the the innovation uh, that is necessary. Um, but we're also doing our best to turn some of that innovation into a safe city sort of approach. So um, you want to enable people to. Um, operate the machine directly, uh, to read the documents, to, to understand the software and contribute to the software and understand all the parameters in, in your wallet and, uh, and of all the different DeFi protocols. Um, but you also want, uh, for probably the majority, uh, to provide uh, safe city kind of access. So Wild West versus safe city, um, so that uh, we can take the best of, uh, of what's available uh, and packaged up and ensure that people um, can't um, lose their precious assets, um, don't get hacked. So um, we have the potential to build an infrastructure uh, that is not exploitative in the in the same way that uh, Web2 and, and previous economies um, have been. Um, and that are empowering and, and bring economic and political agency to hopefully every. Y'all have investors, uh, I think even in your latest round, where they are kind of the behemoths of the old financial ecosystem, JP Morgan and, mm -hmm. and MasterCard, UBS. To what degree do you think, like, are they hedging their bets by saying we're going to bet on one of the biggest entities within Web3 and, and crypto and DeFi? Or is it an acknowledgement of like, we need to understand more and this is one of the ways to do it. And on the alternate side of that, do you think it's more likely that they work their way into crypto or are the, is there going to be a new breed of like bank like institutions that are named like Aave and Uniswap uh, and, and compound? Yeah. Um, so we, uh, the answer is both. Um, we, 
have, again, going back to the convergence thesis where, where we've been working with hundreds of organizations over the years, um, some of them financial institutions, uh, to bring this technology to them. Um, so we have multi-year agreements with the uh, major financial institutions uh, to enable them to use the theorem technology, um, either uh, in private networks on Azure, um, or or as they can, uh, as the opportunities become available, um, to start thinking about uh, how to do things on mainnet, uh, whether so. Our NFT pipeline is really big in, in terms of projects that we're building out or, or, or looking at. Or, um, and so that's uh, a great avenue. And, uh, and as regulation clarifies, as the liquidity um, gets bigger in DeFi, um, uh, as the, the technologies mature, um, it, it's just unstoppable, uh, basically. And, and so... Uh, Banks are, are very good at uh, at finding situations that uh, that are valuable, and uh, whether they're lowering costs or, or doing things that they they couldn't previously do for themselves uh, for their clients, um, uh, they're they're going to figure out a way to uh, to make use of that. Um, we've been heavily consumer focused in this phase. Um, Developer focused in it and consumer focused, so developer focused through Infura and Drupal and got customer service and, and security audit um, and consumer focused uh, mostly in MetaMask. But we also have um, MetaMask Institutional, which is onboarding uh, crypto financial firms uh, quite rapidly. Um, and um, we're entering a phase um, in which Nation state money is, um, to put it not so politely, dying. Um, it is uh, depreciating in value. It's not yielding, um, and it's it's not looking good. Uh, so uh, we're at the end. It looks like of an eighty-year debt super cycle. If you, you know, the Strauss and Howe system uh, of generations, and we're, we're basically in a fourth turning, and we're moving into an era where we. We need to find a new paradigm uh, on which to organize society. Decentralized protocols will be that paradigm, and they'll they will bring greater trust. Um, and um, if you look at the Michael Saylors of the world, who are doing a, a really interesting job of uh, of helping enterprises, just businesses, not financial institutions, uh, recognize that. Uh, hey, this new economy is being built and there's a new kind of money. Uh, you might want to hold that on your balance sheet. Um, this parallel economy has been operating for 10 plus years. Um, it's all the different monies in that system have been volatile. But uh, if you look at it uh, on a semi-log chart, uh, it's a straight line or, or exponential, uh, essentially, <laughs> essentially um, uh, on a normal chart. Um, and um, you're probably going to want to protect yourself essentially so uh you you know the uh the narrative of uh weakening money depreciating money uh and sound money in the form of gold or or corporate you, know, you can you can protect yourself in other ways by by investing in stocks um and there's digitally sound money in the form of bitcoin and ultrasound money and so uh we're gonna see a lot of the old economy money uh, moving into our ecosystem and projects like metamask institutional are not only going to be servicing the crypto financial entities but uh, uh, there are thousands of companies uh, that are taking crypto for goods and services and they're going to increasingly be holding it on balance sheet uh, and so we're um, in a great position to provide a, a lot of the tooling for that yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I like what you said about, you know, we, we need sort of this new paradigm and all, all the money is sort of dying. Um, and it even seems in some ways that um, governments have recognized this, right? Like one of the biggest trends of the last few years has been um, the Bank of England in my country and um, uh, several others around the world all spinning up a central bank digital currency. And I don't think any of them are in practice yet. 
Um, but there, there's like there's one there's basically one per country. Everyone wants to do one. Um, I don't really know what they mean by it, uh, like what it's supposed to be. Um, but it seems like they've accepted that um, uh, using these um, uh, systems where it doesn't rely on a centralized a central party going like I, yeah, I sent some money over there, just trust us. Um, is the future. Um, what do you think their sort of approach with this is uh, is going to be? Do you think they're going to build a bunch of blockchains that never get used? <laughs> what, what's the plan? So it depends on the nation state. Um, there's, there's a bit of a rollout in China. Uh, it's not going to be a very decentralized system. Um, banks, central banks have been in the business of adopting new technology uh, for monetary systems and financial systems. Um, for hundreds of years, I guess, um, and this is a better technology um, to issue and, and represent money. Um, central bank digital currencies uh, can be retail in nature. Uh, they can um, just be wholesale systems where it's just uh, amongst uh, different banking, financial institution organizations. Um, so there, there are a lot of issues to be worked out. Uh, do, do people get get accounts uh, with central banks? Do we do we still need um, other kinds of banks, commercial banks? And so, um, what I believe we're going to see is a lot of exploration. Uh, it's going to take a bunch of years uh, for central bankers and bankers to to figure that stuff out. Um, and you don't want to mess with systems that uh, billions of people depend on. Um, so it has to be really prudently explored and rolled out. Um, what I anticipate is that uh, our ecosystem will move so much faster than uh, the legacy economy can move uh, and that will build a lot of parallel infrastructure. And really the, the next generation economy is going to be built on our technology um, and we'll still need nation states and we'll still need nation state money. Uh, it should be built with this better technology, and it's going to need to bridge uh, to the better technology. So uh, I don't think uh, um, Canada, my, my home country, is going to build um, a loony net, um, Canadian money network, uh, that isn't plugged into <laughs> that isn't plugged into important elements of what's um, becoming a growing mainstream economy, uh, and so. Um, maybe nation states issue on uh, major public blockchains. Maybe they bridge to major public blockchains. Um, it could be that they have their own network and, and the tokens just get wrapped. Um, tokens get frozen on on the central bank chain. Um, so we, we've done a bunch of central bank digital currency projects, and in some cases, it's uh, uh, they have really good goals like. Uh, uh, we want the system to be robust, even if the central bank's nodes go down. Um, so uh, I, I'm really not worried about central banks. I, I think uh, they need to be uh, an important part of the next generation economy. Um, I do think the nature of money is qualitatively shifting. Um, so money is a lubricant in, in commercial transactions. Um, and increasingly, we don't need it. Uh, we, uh, because these things of value, these uh, these digital things of value, can just be swapped for one another. Uh, and in fact, um, MetaMask has a swapping capability, uh, and we think of that uh, as we think of MetaMask as your digital authority, where, where you can confirm transactions. And the act of swapping is actually the act of doing in many things. So if I want to participate in this DeFi protocol, I swap into it uh, and I'm, I'm doing. Um, and that's intimately associated with the payment rails too because you're basically buying one token uh, for another. Um, so money will be changing. I think of money increasingly as uh, context dependent. Um, money will be community focused, uh, context or community based money. I think of it as tribal money. Um, uh, DAOs, no, and really the nature of investment, uh, the nature of innovation um, is all tied up in this. Um, 
in the not too distant future, having large pools of capital will be less important than having good ideas and being able to create community because you'll be able to um, snap your fingers if you've got a great community um, and create a billion dollars of magic internet money uh, and your community will accept that magic internet money um, and get the work done. Uh, that, uh, that accomplishes that vision. Uh, so um, nation states will continue to be important and, and will need nation state money, uh, but nation states will be just one of the many communities that, uh, that we're members of. It seems like if you can achieve that greater capital efficiency where less uh, cash or whatever needs to be on hand because it is more liquid to get between productive assets or investable assets or whatever, um, that would potentially created a huge economic boom just in the sense of that capital that's historically yeah. needed for centralized liquidity uh, essentially just gets deployed um, and, and used in the ecosystem. Um, do you feel... Yeah, so, so less, less fewer, fewer sort of useless buffers of capital um, that are just sitting around because because you don't want to be too late on something. Uh, but also, you're, uh, we're, we're moving into a real-time economy. Um, we have value creation events in our economy, and they're separated by hours, days, and weeks uh, as transactions clear and settle. Um, but as we move into this real-time economy, uh, uh, clearing and settlement happens in the instant of the transaction in, in many cases. And, and so you're shrinking the duration between value creation events and uh, and you guys know the value of, of compounding uh, of value creation. So uh, I can imagine that being a, a tremendous growth driver for the economy. One of my potential concerns with that, and Kobe made a joke about this back when Uniswap V3 launched was with greater capital efficiency, is it just providing better liquidity to the people that are dumping the top or whatever? Um, or like if you get a period of significant contraction where everybody wants to sell because that's easier essentially to swap, um, do you create greater kind of elasticity during those moments of panic and potential for like a flash crashes essentially across an economy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this liquidity um, is really dangerous in an ill-designed system. Um, and we don't know how to design um, efficient, effective, safe systems yet uh, with the uh, um, dampers um, so that uh, um, when things are going orderly and well, uh, it's just uh, free and fluid. And when something happens, uh, you can put some guards up, uh, slow things down potentially. Um, I think we're going to get there. I think uh, it'll take years and, and layers of mechanism design to, to create systems that uh, that behave pretty well um, in times of crisis, but also we've had time, we've had a lot of crises in our ecosystem and um, the centralized systems tend to go down. Um, they can't keep up or, uh, you know, but, but we've experienced crashes that would take down the legacy economy for a decade. Um, and we do that pretty regularly, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, and it just keeps working. Um, it works the next day. It works an hour later just fine. It works the next day just fine. Uh, we can have uh, orderly, um, orderly unwinding of, of a lot of stacking um, in our economy. Uh, and the stacking... It's not all totally transparent, but it, it's all, uh, you know, it, it's hard to understand uh, exactly what's stacked in, in real time. Um, but it is really all out in the open um, as opposed to sort of a shadow banking system where um, assets are hypothecated and rehypothecated a lot of times. And uh, um, crisis of 2008 led to just, people realizing that nobody knew who owned what. Um, and it was a, a house of cards that was stacked so high um, that uh, um, when it came down, it, it just 
it froze everything, caused uh, caused tremendous damage and tremendous loss. Um, we'll we'll certainly have too much leverage in our ecosystem and and uh, and some wicked corrections, uh, but um, it works as designed, pretty much. Yeah, at least at the end, you know who's got what and who's lost all their money. Instead of like, <laughs> have I lost all my money? Can someone tell me if I lost all my money? Do you say I own that? Yeah. So, so um, it's it's good it's good to know that rather than to, to sort of suffer in uncertainty for a few years and maybe, maybe <laughs> I still have maybe I still have that asset. You haven't lost all your money. You've just been rehypothecated. Don't worry, <laughs> you'll be all right. Yeah, it's just three AC. You've got it now. Yeah, they're looking after it That's for a right. while. Um, um, this, uh, this year has sort of been the year of the smart contract platform in a way you've had, um, you know, Bitcoin hasn't had like a, a huge, um, performance, nor has it really entered the, um, the new cycles too much. You had a bit when, uh, Elon, um, bought a bunch of Bitcoin and then you had a bit when Elon decided he didn't like Bitcoin anymore 10 days later or something. Um, Just testing liquidity. Yeah, but you've had like this huge boom of um, NFTs hitting the mainstream. You've had, um, you know, uh, these huge alternative layer one moments where Solana went on a huge run, Avalanche went on a huge run, Luna went on a huge run earlier, like this month or this week or something. Um, you've had um, like meme coins on uh, on Ethereum or on uh, Binance's version of Ethereum. Um, and um, all these other uh, layer ones sort of really, really, really popping off. And as Ethereum uh, gas fees have got quite high and potentially um, priced out people that are new to crypto, um, it's given an opportunity for these alternative uh, layer one, alternative smart contract platforms um, to have their moment, um, I guess, or, or to, to have a, a, a boom of growth and, and a to attract developers and stuff like that. How do you see the future? Do you see a multi-chain future where there are um, a lot of um, like layer one experiments happening? Um, or do you think that uh, the end goal is like a return to value and the uh, most decentralized and um, best built blockchain will win? Yeah, so for a long time, I and, and others in the ecosystem have seen a, a multi-chain future. And so I, I think the ecosystem is really coming into its own now. Um, um, one way I describe it is that uh, we're building an internet of blockchains. And another way is uh, uh, sort of lots of decentralized protocols, um, some of which are, are smart contract systems, but others that subserve different functionalities like decentralized storage and bandwidth and heavy compute and decentralized identity, et cetera. Um, so I think it's all going according to plan, somebody's plan, um, or the ecosystem in, it, in its uh, collective wisdom's plan. Uh, we are decidedly out of the era of monolithic blockchains. Um, that was an important era, um, which helped us uh, understand how to do a lot of things. Um, but engineers in different industries tend to um, make things modular and, and optimize modules uh, for efficiency. Um, and that's that's where we are uh, and where we're going increasingly in our ecosystem. So um, the, monolith, the monolith blockchain uh, involves three major components, uh, security, execution, and storage. Uh, security um, is dominated right now uh, by Ethereum and Bitcoin. Um, to projects that have assiduously focused on decentralization and will continue to do so. Um, that's a hard thing uh, to catch up to. Um, a lot of projects are less worried about massive decentralization and more focused on execution, high transaction throughput, uh, whether they're Ethereum virtual machines or, or other kinds of uh, uh, virtual machine systems. Um, and um, Ethereum is already scaling uh, via layer two systems, rollups, and other technologies. Um, uh, those systems are reasonably inexpensive. Um, uh, they, as all these systems start to get more utilized, they're, they're going to get more expensive. Uh, but uh, uh, the layer one systems, the layer one. Uh, 
uh, sort of quote challenger systems are really competing with the layer two systems on Ethereum because the layer two systems are going to get very inexpensive and, and very high throughput. Um, and so you have, and, and we're consensus works with a lot of those projects, a lot of the layer twos and, and increasingly other projects, uh, um, near, Ava, et cetera. Um, so we, uh, we're fans of the whole ecosystem and supportive of the whole ecosystem and trying to build bridges and, and figuring out ways uh, that we can all occupy our niches. Um, so um, projects like Solana are spending a huge amount uh, for security. Uh, so they're giving away a lot of tokens and the revenue, uh, the fee revenue uh, is orders of magnitude less than, than what they're paying for security. Uh, so um, we feel like a lot of these projects um, in order to sort of land the business model long-term are possibly going to turn to Ethereum, uh, figure out how to L2 themselves um, via roll-up technology, uh, for instance, uh, so that they can essentially get free security, uh, free-ish security. They'll still have to pay um Ethereum layer one fees amortized over thousands or tens of thousands of transactions. Um, and in that way, uh, we can have lots of different execution environments. Um, and we need that just like the web needs lots of different kinds of database technologies like SQL databases and NoSQL databases and graph databases. Uh, so um, very much look forward to a world where there are lots like an enormous number of layer twos with different characteristics. Um, and some some systems may be able to figure out how to massively decentralize themselves. Um, unless they do that, uh, they won't be able to attract high value assets and high value projects. Um, and with the merge that happens late Q1, early Q, like late Q2, early Q3 uh, of next year, um, with that done, uh, we're gonna get busy uh, adding data availability in the form of shards uh, to Ethereum 2 to, to make that available to layer twos. And so um, uh, we'll see all of this, I think, get uh, really inexpensive uh, in terms of, of running transactions. And I do think that we'll probably see um, different chains. Uh, I think everything will be connected, so you won't see too many little islands, um, but uh, you'll see different chains with less security uh, that uh, sort of bridge themselves to to the whole uh, Web3 mass. I just have myself mute. Web3 really took off as a, whoever na whoever came up with a Web3 name, genius, because the distributed ledger technology one, that was bad. That wasn't working <laughs> out. Blockchain yeah. was bad. That was like, that didn't work out. Web3, people love Web3, don't they? That, everyone yeah. loves it. So so <laughs> I remember I remember sitting around a big table in our house in Zug in Switzerland, um, and we did start to use Web3. Um, it was... 2014, I think. Co-founded um, Web3. And, there you go. There's another one. <laughs> actually, actually, I, I, I think the word first maybe came out of Gavin's mouth, Gavin Wood. Mm -hmm. And I think he created a post um, uh, that was actually a pretty good piece. I think uh, maybe on his blog, he wrote something about what, what Web3 might be. But, but we started using that uh, a little bit in 2014. Too scared to go on Gavin's blog, um, <laughs> but uh, so it, it it seems to me that um, if you believe in this like m super connected world with uh, uh, everything on like plugging into Ethereum, basically like Ethereum is sort of the backbone of this. Um, uh, uh web three world and a lot of these chains move over and become um become roll-ups do you think the native tokens still exist like so you think you know let's say we have miscellaneous uh layer one chain i'm going to make it up uh cup chain cup chain and you've got cup token mm -hmm. as it's like native currency do you do you think they just yeah. stop using it or do you think it becomes a thing on on the uh l2 or what yeah um so as I said before, I think the, the nature of money qualitatively shifts. Uh, we already have lots of tokens in, in society in the form of shares and bonds and, 
in currencies, uh, derivatives, etc. And so you uh, you don't want to be dependent on tokens of a protocol that um, that you're sitting on, that you're utilizing, because uh, there's baggage in, in that token and in that protocol. And so now you have an opportunity to um, define programmatically what your token does and means. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for, for just uh, granular design freedom uh, to retain these tokens uh, and use them for what they're supposed to be used for in, in each for protocol. For anyone that's like watching, we've got some people in chat and we've got um, a bunch of airdrop hunters and stuff. Like, what are the um, most exciting teams you see that are building um, uh, roll ups today? Because like, I think people will know about Arbitrum and Optimism and um, Starkware, possibly the big ones um, that uh, get a lot of um, mind share. Are there other things people might not know about yet that are super interesting? Um yeah so we work with the ones that you mentioned and uh and a bunch more um and i hesitate to uh um to mention a, a bunch of teams because I, I just don't want to sig signal <laughs> sing, <laughs> yeah, single enough. can't pick winners single out uh, a small set of them when we actually invest in a lot of them uh, mm -hmm. So we have a group called Ethereal Ventures um, uh, who does a brilliant job being on the bleeding edge of the ecosystem. Uh, so there, I, I didn't talk too much about data availability, but uh, there's some really great projects around um, guaranteed data availability um, and uh, validation of layer twos. Um, so um, it, I would just get into trouble for not mentioning some projects if I did mention some. Um, and because you mentioned uh, Gavin, it reminds me that um, a bunch of the early Ethereum team or Ethereum co-founders, as they uh, uh, are titled on Wikipedia, have all started their own um, like crypto projects afterwards. So people have built on Ethereum and then left and, uh, and built Gavin's one. Um, what's Charles his name? Haskinson. Uh, and then um, I'm missing some people. I'm looking on Wikipedia. Where'd they go? But yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, what do you think of those projects? And you give a very political answer if you want. We won't press you on it. <laughs> but, um, do you like, do you, do, is it like fundamental disagreements in like, oh, Ethereum's going this way. I think this way is this other direction is superior. Um, or is it just, that was fun. Going to do it again. <laughs> well, um so I think a lot of different projects have a lot of different philosophies behind them and a lot of different technical approaches. Uh, it's a pretty vast problem space and it's really good that lots of different approaches are, are exploring the solution space. Um, and so Polkadot's uh, a lot of strong technologists um, and they'll build, they are building a good system. Um, there are a lot of great uh, ecosystems out there, Cosmos, Avalanche, Near, Solana, et cetera. And we really need a, a ton of activity in lots of those ecosystems. Um, I, I think Ethereum has a, a massively unfair advantage, both uh, because of <laughs> when, when it gains traction and um, just the, the size and speed uh, of the development of the ecosystem. Um, um, Size and speed of the development of the ecosystem is quite interesting because, um, as you mentioned earlier, when we were talking about uh, central bank digital currencies, it gets harder to mess with or change around a system that is relied on by so many people. And um, Ethereum uh, has, um, you know, tried to maintain a. a uh, let's move like relatively quickly. Um, let's change things. Let's build, you know, um, uh, the things that like well, there, there is a roadmap. There's a lot of stuff to to still do, but at the same time, it's growing. People uh, are using Ethereum um, for more and more stuff, um, and it, you know, it's not like uh, 2016 or whatever anymore. Um, there's now uh, MetaMask got 25 million daily active users or whatever versus whatever it was back then i'm sure uh a handful um 
Is it higher? <laughs> 50 million, 100 million, who knows? Um, but um, how do you think Ethereum can maintain that ability to uh, make change um, while the ecosystem and the people that rely on people have... Um, you know, parts of their financial life on Ethereum uh, is also growing because it's not so much the Facebook move fast and break things, is it? Because no one wants anything to break. Um, so it's not a new problem. Um, same issues were raised uh, uh, for the internet and the web. Um, Vitalik and others articulated uh, the idea that uh, uh, we need to simplify um some of the, the lower layers um, and enable innovation uh, to proceed at higher layers, um, significantly independent of what's going on uh, below. Uh, and so I, I think that's the, the macro answer. Um, we, we certainly need to continue to improve the execution chain and the beacon chain, uh, pre-merge, post-merge, we need to build out the uh, sharding, um, what you can do is if you have a, a new use case, uh, you can use the Ethereum technology. Uh, you can set up a side chain. Uh, we built something um, called Palm Network um, for, for to focus on NFTs. Um, our friends at Gnosis are um, uh, about to rename XDAI, uh, I believe. Uh, they, they have the votes to to turn it into Gnosis chain. Um, and so they can build an ecosystem on the Ethereum technology um, and it's bridged uh, in a sense, it's it's kind of standalone, but but with the bridge. And so anybody can can use the technology and stand up something or improve something uh, for particular use cases and connect it into the mass of decentralized protocols. Um, and one can imagine Palm uh, becoming a layer two on Ethereum. Um, that's in the in the roadmap. One can imagine the Gnosis chain becoming a layer two and a layer three on Wait, what's a layer uh, three? Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so so it is in Gnosis's plan uh, to create a post merge architecture. Uh, for the XDI system. So they're, they're going to be setting up their own beacon chain. Um, and if they get uh, that sort of uh, scalable network built, um, and if they're able to do, who knows, in four years or seven years, whatever, if they're able to, to figure out how to um, turn that thing into a roll-up, um, then we have something that, that uh, we've been talking about for a long time, which is uh, sort of quadratic scalability or layer three scalability uh, for uh, the extended Ethereum ecosystem. I really like How do you feel about layer three, Ledger? Uh, I hope do I you understand layer two yet? I hope I get to make a lot of money off of it. And <laughs> I hope it makes Ethereum cheaper and more affordable so, and more secure to use. So, somebody's <laughs> going to launch a, a layer three token in about five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be me. <laughs> Nobody just has a one click button. He just inputs the name, clicks <laughs> just, the button based on whatever someone mentions are, on the screen. Are, are we on are we on like a five second delay for that reason? Yeah. That's yeah, I don't I, I think there's virtually no delay. So, um I'm we're already live, it's good. I've got ninety nine percent of the tokens myself. Most, um, most of I've given one percent to you because <laughs> you're a co founder yeah, of layer three. I, I would like to be a co founder of that project. Yeah. <laughs> most of the um you know, these specific design solutions that you've talked about. I really like that for um, a chain, side chain or a layer two or whatever, to be have this really specific architecture for a use case. I think that's a really cool um, use of, of, of that layer. What, one of the things I'm interested in is the just composability between all these things and then also kind of the point of origin for people. <laughs> Like, is there going to be a place where someone who can never afford to be on uh, ETH layer one, where their their origin story begins at, at, you know, in Arbitrum or something, and then they have composability sure. with their assets amongst all these different places? How do you envision all of that operating in real life, especially as you improve the user experience for like normal people? Yeah, so I've never been worried about uh, um 
damage to composability. Um, it's amazing that we have real-time composability um, for uh, DeFi Legos. Um, and we can continue to figure out which DeFi Legos need uh, instant composability versus like three second composability versus 12 second composability. We'll, we'll have lots of uh, uh, connectivity mechanisms, um, bridges and other sorts of mechanisms. So whether you're going down into layer one or, or whether you're using Connect or, or other kinds of systems, um, it's a lot better than the composability that we have in the uh, in the legacy financial system, uh, and we'll, we'll just we'll keep improving the uh, uh, the speed or, or latency. You're not um, satisfied with T uh, plus two settlement uh, for your trades? T, uh, not not very composable. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, so. Um, the, the, the market will figure that out, uh, both both in terms of what needs to be situated next to what uh, and and what sort of mechanisms uh, can be built to to make things um, talk to one another faster. How do you feel um, like the uh, the beacon chain has um, uh, has been going over like since it's launched, it's basically been live about a year now, right? Maybe a little bit more mm -hmm. um, than a year. How do you feel about staking diversity um, and um, like progress on the chain and, and looking forward to the merge, I guess, within the next nine months, I guess it'll be done probably within six. Yeah. So it's gone astonishingly well. Um, we were pretty confident that it would be well received, but, but really gratified that uh, um, that I don't know how much is staked right now. Maybe forty billion dollars, um, uh, two hundred thousand uh, validators. Uh, certainly less than two hundred thousand individuals, uh, but uh, it's remarkably uh, decentralized. Um, and uh, certainly, we'll, we will always, I think, um, have scrutiny on how decentralized things are um uh, it is decentralization versus centralization is cyclical over history and uh, there's a lot of value to be captured and, and so people are going to organize to try to capture more value and uh, feedback loops might uh, uh, might make it easier to to capture too much value but uh, throughout the years we've seen uh, with different pools we've seen social reactions to pools get uh, um, sort of reorganize um, the balances. Um, the issue of exchanges um, having too much power is one to pay attention to, uh, but you, all, you also can't imagine um, that exchanges would do egregiously problematic things. Uh, they might try to make more money, um, but uh, um, Coinbase isn't isn't going to rug pull uh, Ethereum. Uh, <laughs> I'm more worried about those folks at Liza. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, just sh sh shady, <laughs> absolutely. Those co just just very joking, very to <laughs> totally joking. <laughs> I'm getting dunked on. Yeah. Um, do, I, do I need to do the disclosure live if nah. I'll get dunked on? I don't think so. Nah, um, co-founder for everything between the two of you. So. <laughs> uh, I'm a Lido co-founder. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody please make oh, the co-founder meme and just put... <laughs> <laughs> oh, What's your gosh. favorite meme in crypto no, since we're talking about it? Um, that's a tough one. Um, can I say that uh, everything is a meme? Is a meme? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, someone just sent me. Someone on Telegram just sent me a conversation between Budweiser, which is beer dot eth, and Pepsi, and there's like just saying like wag me they're saying we're all going to make it and shit GM. to each other using like that like crypto <laughs> language yeah. all the politicians are using yeah. gm everything is a meme they've stolen all our memes yeah we got to find new ones yeah. <laughs> i think layer three might be so, a meme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I, I 
I actually think that uh, uh, first everything is a meme. Um, and I, I think that as we move um, from the previous economy, which, which was very, which is very physical, it, it's about uh, uh, atoms and, and configuring materials into products and delivering those products to, to where they're needed. And then, uh, yes, using memes to, to drive demand for those products or drive demand for products that you don't really need. Um, moving from that uh, physical scarcity based economy uh, to an economy that, uh, um, that is essentially all about creativity, um, moving from atoms to bits, uh, understanding that the machines, uh, the robots and automation are, are going to make it easy for us to have our needs met, our physical needs met, and, and free us uh, to, um, to live in virtual worlds and metaverses, to have uh, superhuman powers um in in you know based on physics engines that that let us transport instantaneously or, or get information on, on the whole context that we're sitting in um i think in that world of, of creativity and gamification and gamified financialization um everything will absolutely be um even more profoundly i mean uh, so, so it'll it'll all be uh, about uh, uh, coming up with some cool idea. Maybe it's a, a real innovation, or maybe it's just uh, some some cute hybrid animal um, that everybody rallies around in their in their DAO community, and uh, um, uh, things are going to get really wacky and really interesting uh, in the uh, in the creativity economy. Maybe MetaMask is doing a bunch of foxes profile pictures. Maybe that was the alpha week in there. I'm reading between the lines. You don't have to confirm nor Oops. deny. It's better if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be a, a funky fox or whatever they're going to be called. Um, <laughs> the last serious question I had on my um, little list of stuff to ask was about um, MEV. Um, it's like a, a thing that's become... Um, I guess, uh, very trendy over the last year or so. And it's like evolved quite quickly. Um, people are printing money, like the, the smartest, um, uh, MEV brains are printing money, running, um, their searches or whatever. And I think flashbots is probably one of the most important, um, projects in the Ethereum ecosystem. I think maker maker is probably the other one maker and, uh, and uh, Flashbots, two of the most important projects in, in the Ethereum ecosystem. But um, as we go towards the merge, um, MEV might play an even bigger role, right? Because yeah. you may get um, validator groups working together to um, boost the yield for stakers by coordinating on MEV. So they get really good at um, doing MEV as a group. They repay some of that um, revenue to stakers, so the uh, APY for mm -hmm. that group of um uh of um stakers or that staking provider um goes up a little bit to attract more people to stake with them um is this something that you thought about back in the day and how do you think the mev landscape is going to play out over the next sort of uh year or so um so we didn't specifically think of of mav mev back in the day um we certainly recognize that um uh, that fee mechanisms uh, were were really brain dead. Uh, you know, uh, first best price. Um, uh, it was incredibly inefficient. Uh, all the wallets were just sort of setting a default, and nobody was changing those. And uh, so, we knew that uh, a lot of sophistication would come to that eventually uh, when when it became relevant. Um, MEV in Ethereum one uh, is evolving and will be very different from MEV and Ethereum 2. Uh, WEV um, is a thing that a lot of people are, are paying attention to. Uh, so that's wallet extractable value. Um, and I think it's, I think it's going to work out well uh, because I think it's going to be about um, making consumers happy. Um, so I, I think that uh, we're going to land on 
probably a, a continually evolving set of systems that are designed to uh, make communities happy, uh, make individual users happy, make uh, uh, um, organizations, enterprises happy um, because they will have choices uh, on how they uh, utilize the system. And I think uh, we'll end up uh, paying the users of the system um, out of uh, the MEV or, or the, the WEV. So in that sense, I, I think uh, the decentralized nature of the users of the system uh, will keep everybody honest. I might expose myself as a noob. Is wallet extracted value like watching like profitable wallets and like copy trading them? Um, it's a about the idea that, uh, uh, that there is MAV um, and where the transactions get routed uh, is where the MAV uh, will happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Ledger, I've gone through my list. This is like the second time ever I've made a list of like topics. So uh, I hope you feel <laughs> that's a large compliment. We normally do zero preparation. Um, you got anything on yours, yeah. Brian? I'm interested in your thoughts on like naming things and identity. Uh, <laughs> well, you were talking about important apps. Um, I'm actually registering an ENS domain right now uh, for Shard42. That's our hangout in the future. You just talk about sharding so much. It makes me remember that we did a Shard42 meme at one point. And I, uh, I now own the ENS on that. So, um, But... The identity side of things and like what is a wallet? Is a wallet a person um, or is it an account or is it multiple things all together? Like, what do you think about the importance of one user friendly names? So, you know, dot ETHs or whatever else that might be used in ENS or how is that integrated into or how do you envision those things could be integrated into MetaMask for more ease of use? Um, and then how do you think about like singular identification versus wallet-based identification where, you know, someone could have dozens of identities that are, are authenticated through a wallet. Um, so your wallet is your digital authority. Um, the MetaMask team um, has done an amazing job of understanding different aspects of security for the decentralized protocol ecosystem. And uh, they've been moving towards enabling granu granular, uh, increasingly granularized security uh, so that uh, you can access anything uh, on Web3 and, and eventually on, on Web2 um, from this portal that, uh, that represents your digital authority. It's your, it's your digital authority because uh, other applications can rely on it um, and outsource a lot of the security um, to the user and, and to MetaMask or, or systems like it. Um, and um, essentially, whether it's uh, um, basically um, validating what, uh, what you've done in an application by, by clicking on a button in your wallet, um, that is likely to be uh, one of the major interfaces uh, to the whole web. Um, and you're going to want to do that from lots of different personas uh, in different contexts. And, and so um, uh, you'll be able to bring personas together or keep personas separate. Uh, you can already do that uh, as different accounts in different wallets. Uh, but um, um, one of the projects uh, that spun out of consensus a long time ago, uh, Three Box is doing a really good job of uh, enabling um, multiple personas to essentially be organized. Uh, so in the form of DIDs, decentralized IDs, in the form of uh, verifiable credentials or verifiable claims, um, we're just starting to... Um, get a solid handle on decentralized identity and reputation. Uh, there's a, a long way to go still, um, but uh, it, it is such a deep, uh, identity is such a deep and subtle problem. Uh, we've been uh, working on it uh, 
via many teams at Consensus since, since nearly the start, uh, and many others in the ecosystem uh, have been working on that. Um, so I think um, as DAOs get uh, increasingly politically important, um, both capital formation DAOs and investing DAOs and protocol governance DAOs, um, I think we're going to um, have a, a forum in which uh, um, identity is going to start to ramify uh, very significantly. I feel like from a user experience side of it, there's still a few things that are missing in terms of making that simple though. Like I, I have, I'm limited by how do I um, authenticate my wallet? So, you know, if yeah. I have a wallet that's just on my mobile phone or I have a wallet that's connected to a hardware wallet where I need to be connected to a particular computer or something like that, but yeah. I want an experience within a DAP that is unified between the two, then I find that that is a bit of a challenge. I think there's an Ethereum improvement proposal for essentially having a wallet that's your source, but then it kind of controls others and maybe that could help solve it. But, you know, kind of tying all that together. So you have a singular user experience, but you may have wallet and, and custody and, you know, different stuff managed from different places. And that's where it's still kind of a little haywire for me versus like a login or something that you use that can be anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a login with Ethereum project going on. Um, I believe Spruce is um, a big part of that project. Um, I hope I didn't get that wrong. Um, it, so the, these are, are multifaceted, subtle issues. Um, and um, I, I don't think we have uh, simple, easy to use answers yet, but yeah. uh, um, we're, we're still so that, that may not be true. Um, we, we don't have adoption uh, for for these systems. So so some systems are uh, enabling you to to tweet something and um, or, or essentially link uh, your legacy uh, personas um, into a, a persona that's uh, um, that holds DIDs. Um, and so basically bootstrapping your Web3 identity from Web2 identity constructs uh, using DIDs and, and VCs. Um, so um, the, the tools are there uh, in terms of the, of the different pieces that uh, are already being configured into, into coherent and usable systems, but uh, the adoption isn't there yet. I tend to think that's a bigger breakthrough than most give it credit for because you basically killed this, this one. This, yeah. Yeah. This, this one is just enormous. Um, and it, you know, from five, six years ago, uh, we thought that, uh, that it decentralized, decentralized identity would be adopted, um, quite soon and quite profoundly. Uh, but it is a really deep, subtle, set of problems yeah and it even qualifies like you know your ethereum address like whatever one you identify as or whatever can operate across most layer twos and you know you, you kind of use the same one if you're on avalanche even um uh, for the c chain or whatever but then you get to solana it's different like so there's a there's so many intricacies about how that connects together yeah. and i feel like when that gets unlocked and you can essentially truly be um you know kobe's whatever his his dot eth is uh everywhere and and authenticate that in a safe way yeah your ability to have secure and, access to all the things you use is enormous yeah and so that that part of the ecosystem is going to be so big and so important we're, we're just talking about the the little foundational components in this discussion right now um but we're going to need to be able to to bring personas together. Um, it, it, let's say you, you just want a loan on something. You might want to have yeah. these three personas that, that you've been um, a good financial actor from, um, and you might want to bring them together uh, for a, a certain message uh, or, or uh, sign something together uh, to, to get yourself into a, a better rate or, or, or a bigger loan. Um, there will be 
um, certificates, educational certificates, uh, some sort of um, VC indicating that you work for a company rather than just typing it into your into your LinkedIn. Um, there will be people making claims about uh, things that happened, uh, making claims about you or your um, characteristics. Um, and we're going to need things like dashboards of all, all the certificates that uh, that are associated with me or things that I care about, uh, um, claims about my behavior, claims that I'm making about uh, about uh, uh, podcast hosts that uh, that do egregious things, uh, and, and and we're gonna we're we're gonna need a mechanism for for challenging these things, and and so you can imagine just a um, probably in your wallet, um, but a, a big uh, dashboard that uh, that helps you monitor your identity and, and reputation and, and those of things that you care about. And I imagine this, uh, the privacy element of that is going to be table stakes, at least at some point to where there's optionality in terms of making something public versus uh, authenticated, but private. Sure. Absolutely. Cool. Chat is maybe trolling me, but loads of people keep asking the same thing, which says, ask about the Jimmy song bet. Do you not remember it, Kobe? Nope. Uh, I already closed the tab because I decided I wasn't going to ask about it, but it was <laughs> shit. I got trolled by chat. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a bet from uh, a conference several years ago, and it was something like by the end of 2023, uh, are there tens of thousands of daily active users or something on Ethereum for some period of time? Uh, and you look, it looks like you're on your way to winning that bet to me, but I could be could be wrong. But um, it was yeah, that's so, already so happened. People... Right? Go ahead. Well, people have been, I, I, I'll uh, elucidate a little bit. Um, people have been asking me about that recently uh, just because there's so much activity. Um, so we uh, we did try to, we got on some calls uh, with Jimmy to, to try to define terms of the bet. Um, and I think he wanted something like 10,000 monthly act, 10,000 daily actives or uh, 100,000 monthly active, something like that. And it was for five separate applications um, and by by some point in time. I, I don't remember. 10, they've been right. 23. I'm, According I'm to um, untrustable source, coindesk.com. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. 10,000 or more daily active users and 100,000 monthly active users for any six calendar months in any 12 calendar month period up to and including May 23. 2023 um, for five unique dApps. Yeah, got it. So, so we tried to to get this all written down, and we tried to bring in third parties to to help us uh, uh, negotiate the languaging, etc. Um, Jimmy is a uh, a smart person, a very rigorous thinker, and a very uh, untrusting individual, uh, and and. Uh, he couldn't get comfortable, and, and so we we never actually memorialized the bet. Um, well, he would have lost. But so I, think, <laughs> I, I think I think we're in pretty good territory right now. Exactly. How much was the bet supposed to be for? How much are you Half down? A million dollars at the time, but it was Bitcoin based, so I don't know. So I think I think he was supposed to pay me in Ether, and I was supposed to pay him in Bitcoin. Oh. Mm. Yikes. <laughs> and, and he, he, even even that even that choice is uh, is looking favorable. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> uh, Ledger, do you wanna do you wanna make a future bet? You got ten years. Do you wanna make a future bet against Joe? Um, Go on, do it. You've got to do it. Ten years by uh, tw the twenty thirty. Let's just say twenty thirty. What's your terms? Make it spicy. I'll bankroll you. All right. The bet is a thousand Ethereum. <laughs> I have nothing to lose here. Uh, we'll up only be the top crypto podcast <laughs> in 2025, or we'll have Kobe, we'll, Kobe have flaked on me and sail the Mediterranean instead. Um, it's not really a can, can I bet. take, do I, do I get the flake side? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I needed preparation from Kobe on making this bet so I could have uh, done it uh, a little smarter. 
right. So I, All right. I, um, I believe the, the metaverse will be called up only by oh, yeah. 10 years from now. Um, we need to fund our own. We'll do a metaverse raise, mate. We can raise it to like a two billion dollar valuation. The up yeah, only metaverse. That sounds. That sounds like a real thing. I heard if you're um, not raising at multi billion dollar valuations, then you're just like not even in the game these days. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, we'll say we've got Joe as co-founder, and the valuation is through the roof. <laughs> Stay um, on the call. Right. I'll offer you some co-founderships. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to do a final question, Ledge? Yeah, so we uh, love to know a bit of alpha from our guests. So if there's any wisdom that you've learned in life, it's certainly not to be financial advice, but you know something that's helped you get through, um, helped you find success in your life, something that's made your life a bit better that you have in mind that our listeners could take advantage of. Uh, we would love a bit of alpha to end the show. Um, something we've been concentrating on in our company, uh, just be be kind to the people around you, take care of the people around you. Um, we're moving into a world where it will be, it is increasingly inexpensive to project power. Um, uh, and so that's both scary um, if you do mean things to people because uh, somebody can hurt you from a distance, um, but it's also probably pretty good as a society uh, because I think it's going to force us all increasingly to, to be nice to each other um, in as many contexts as, uh, uh, as we can manage. I like that very much. Kobe. Let's play us out. Ledger play the music. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thanks so much. Here. You can follow Thanks, guys. Joseph on Twitter, go to consensus.net to check out everything that they're doing. Appreciate you very much. It's been a pleasure. You can also go to uponly.tv to get replays of this episode, audio, subscription options, all that stuff. And then go to uponly.tv slash FTX to make a trade today from one asset to the other. You can buy the dip, you know, if you're worried about the number going down, go buy it. Uh, you can do it at uponly.tv slash FTX. Also track your portfolio and earn yield on your tokens. You can do it all on the FTX app, uponly.tv slash FTX. Thanks. Catch you later.